you to post in the comments section uh, to the extent that you're unable to get in. We thankfully have some help and, and we'll try and um, figure out what we need to do in order to get you in. Um, first and foremost, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining today. I'm Lisa Reutman and I am moderating uh, our panel today for the New York Alternative Investment Roundtable, doing it for the first time as a WebEx phone call, so hopefully this works for everyone in our new reality, and wanted to give a big thank you to all of our sponsors. Hopefully you can see them um, on the uh, WebEx uh, screen right now. And um, with that, why don't we get started? Sounds like we've got most people in at this point. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, for those of you who are on the line, wanted to make sure that um, you're aware that indeed be present this call. And um, just a quick disclaimer, because we wouldn't be a group of lawyers without a disclaimer, um, the opinions expressed today by our speakers and by me are our own and not um, for our organizations. And one last thing for those of you who haven't noticed it, on the lower right-hand side, you have a chat box and you can, and we encourage you to ask questions using that. You can either send those questions to everyone. You'll see there's a toggle to choose everyone or just for the presenters. If you prefer to remain anonymous, I am very happy to uh, read your questions without uh, mentioning your name. And, um, you know, again, the, the topic today, uh, we're hoping you are finding topical. Um, the spread of COVID-19 has certainly rocked the financial world and the way we are all conducting business. And we've definitely gone from those wishful dreams of an occasional work from home day to the reality of, you know, a mandated quarantine. So times certainly have changed. For the last several years, um, the SEC's OC division had business resiliency near the top of their exam priority list, as have many of the global regulators. And it appears that the rubber has finally hit the road and we are all being forced to move from tabletop exercises for our business resiliency to real-time response in what has become just an ever-changing environment, um, impacting the very fabric of the way we live both our personal and professional lives. So today we are very fortunate to have a panel of experts, and I know they're not going to love that I'm telling you that, but they are experts to delve into just a few of the topics related to maintaining some semblance of normalcy and the challenges and pitfalls of even our best intentioned business continuity plans. Um, I'm going to give you a brief uh, background on each of our speakers, and then I'm going to ask them one at a time to just give us a little bit more um, background about their firms and what they do. Um, we have Sandeep Kumbak, who's a veteran of security, privacy, and identity and access management. Um, he served as the master principal solutions architect at um, Okta, and he's helping Okta's most complex global customers adopt cloud technologies and solve their hybrid identity and access management and zero trust based business and technical requirement issues. We also have on the line Charlie Morgan uh, from Alston and Bird who concentrates his practice in litigation, government and uh, internal investigations, including occupational safety and health um, with a heavy focus on employment and labor matters. And then we have um, Bob Exton, who I'm sure you're all very familiar with, who's at Mary Securities and also one of our sponsors. He serves as the co-head of Prime Brokerage and Correspondent Clearing for Mary Asset Securities USA, and he has 37 years of experience in various uh, management positions within Prime Brokerage, Correspondent Clearing, Agency Execution, and Global Finance. With that, I'm going to ask Sandeep, maybe you could kick us off, and then we'll go to Charlie and then to Bob with just a little bit more of a um, intro for uh, on yourself and your background. So, Sandeep, take it away. Absolutely. Absolutely, Lisa. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Sandeep Kumbat, as Lisa introduced, Director of Customer Solutions at Okta. Uh, Okta specializes in delivering cybersecurity solutions, uh, especially around the identity and access management domain. And as a 100-person cloud service, uh, we have about 8,000 customers worldwide, including large-scale uh, financial and asset management organizations. and my focus is primarily on solving the technical and business requirements around a zero trust framework, privacy, and compliance. Bob? Great. And Charlie? All right. Hello, everyone. This is Charlie Morgan, and I'm a partner at Olson & Bird. I'm based in Atlanta. And lately, uh, I've been uh, heading up or co-heading up our firm's coronavirus task force. Uh, helping lead and respond uh, to all of our clients' needs, uh, 
and, and that are rolling out really on an hourly basis, um, as, as you all have seen in terms of this new environment that we're in. Great. And um, Bob, maybe you could uh, give us a little bit more background on you. Did we lose Bob? Okay, just in case we lost Bob, I will give you some background on myself. So um, again, my name is Lisa Reitman. I am currently the general counsel um, for the Americas for um, Pollen Street Capital, which is a UK private equity and credit shop, and have spent um, plenty of time on both the buy side and the sell side. And many of you may um, have known me most recently where I spent the last three years at Bloomberg um, and hosted a regulatory compliance webinar series there. So we may have all heard each other before. Um, maybe we'll get straight to the agenda and just confirm that Bob is um, is back on. I know he's saying that I don't think that we can hear him. Um, and uh, the SEC recently added questions related to um, pandemic resiliency and their ongoing exams. Um, the focus has been on sort of crisis systems and operations and the complexity and feasibility of work from home for both the personnel and for business. They've focused on an impact on the ability to oversee and monitor vendors and service providers, as well as communication issues around um, messaging to staff, clients, and counterparts. With that as sort of a backdrop, we thought we would try and start our conversation by focusing in on some of the complexities of working from home. Um, and what better place to start than with technology, which given the fact that we can't hear Bob, <laughs> it sort of highlights that this is what can happen. Um, so maybe Sandeep, you could sort of start us off with some of the technology challenges around data privacy and protection and other cybersecurity concerns. Certainly. Uh, cybersecurity incidents definitely, you know, in, in the light of COVID-19 uh, outbreak has, has just increased over time and are kind of expected to increase further during the coming months as more and more of us are working remotely and as fraudsters just look to leverage the uncertainty created by the crisis for like, you know, they, they would try out anything or everything like phishing attempts or other forms of social engineering, which are extremely popular uh, these days. And already, I actually saw yesterday as well that there were reports of cyber crim criminals as well as the kind of, you know, so-called nation state hackers using interactive maps. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys have uh, opened up those maps on your phones or desktops, but those red dots showing where the COVID-19 virus has spread across. And those interactive maps displaying those coronavirus statistics and other types of base documents are used to plan malware on devices. So some of the fraudsters have also taken to posing as centers for disease control, like CDC officials, in, in attempts to obtain financial account information. So that's really scary, and I'm not sure, you know, how our employer is doing to educate all of their employees, but that's uh, certainly important to know that those kind of uh, frauds are occurring right now. So from a, uh, I think from a public safety and privacy perspective, there's a lot of data being analyzed, um, like uh, including the location data gleaned from, uh, you know, the cell phones to track the proliferation of the virus. If folks are following the social distancing protocols or not, they're actually trying to see if, uh, if, the, if the cell signal actually gives them that idea to almost like technology companies who have captured your facial recognition data, uh, they, they are expected to share that from their apps to the federal government as a means to map the presence of the virus. So the extent of data being shared and how it is secure is, is kind of unknown and the use of this data seemingly is continuously pushing the bounds of the US privacy laws for sure. So it means definite data privacy and protection are top of the minds of all the CISOs around the world and uh, there's kind of firefighting going on right now to, to prevent these kind of incidents. But um, some of the other cybersecurity uh, concerns, Lisa, which you were pointing out were uh, around perimeter defense to phishing, right? So phishing, as you know, pose a lot of risk to any organization. And in fact, I was actually reading about it that 88% of businesses experienced uh, targeted phishing attacks in 2019. 88% is almost like everyone, some, someone could have not fallen for the bait, but this attack looks like any electronic communication, like an email from your bank or your telecom company or 
Um, maybe a purchase made on any of your accounts or some retail coupon code which you might be searching here and there. So, however, what you don't see is that the sender, in fact, is a hacker. And the real purpose of that email was to trick you and just giving them information, anything they can obtain from you, like usernames or passwords or uh, credit card information you're entering in somewhere or, for the matter, anything they can use to access your account and compromise your organization. So, and there are types of these fishers, right? Some cast have a very wide net, so blasting thousands of emails and hoping that someone or some random individual falls for the trick, right? And in spare phishing, uh, they target specific individuals. And most of the times I've seen executives being targeted, uh, privileged account holders being targeted, and, and they, they actually make that phishing uh, email or communication specifically for these guys. So, uh, and what happens after that? After that, they are able to get into the network, so it's a network infiltration, account lockouts, uh, shutdown of the corporate system, steal the IP, and, and then again, of course, ask for ransomware and those kind of things, right? To, I think, first of all, to help mitigate all of these phishing and privacy issues, employees need to be educated on how to identify phishing communication. Like use of, uh, I'm pretty sure, use of AI, artificial intelligence and machine learning, to filter some spam communication on the, in the get-go get itself. Like when you get the email, when you get the communication, it should have an algorithm in your uh, collaboration software to detect that, hey, this is not seeming to be the right vendor they're claiming to be. And add some extra layers of access control, such as multi-factor authentication. It would definitely help to ensure no one falls for the bait, or at least there's some flag uh, kind of circulating around the administration side of the house. The other kind of concept, Lisa, which you were uh, asking for initially was, um, which is really gaining popularity even before uh, the COVID-19 outbreak, is the notion of zero trust. And, uh, like, so what is zero trust? Uh, earlier, like, security policies were kind of biased. Like, if you're coming in from my network, I trust you more. If you're not coming in from a, net a network, then I won't even allow you, and I would create kind of a user experience barrier for you. So zero trust on the, on the contrary is an information security framework which states that organizations should not trust any entity inside or outside of their perimeter at any time. It provides the visibility and IT controls like needed to secure, manage, and monitor every device, every user, every application, and every network being used to access the business data. Now, when you think about this all context coming in together, you essentially are not trusting anything, but you're verifying everything that is it the right context you're providing. And as more of our workforce starts embracing the remote working lifestyle today or tomorrow, the zero trust security framework would ensure to analyze like various different contexts from an access control standpoint. And then so thereby definitely reducing the number and impact of the data breaches out there. Does that help, Lisa? You there? Sandeep? Sandeep, and I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you could, if you could um, tell us if there's anything specific that you're hearing your clients ask about, um, especially on the accessibility front. Absolutely. Um, I think I hear a little bit of background noise from one of the phones. Uh, Lisa, can you? See if you can mute one of those. Um, yeah, does anybody, um, to the extent that you are not speaking, if you wouldn't mind muting, that would be great. Thank you so much. Awesome. Go so you're asking about accessibility for staff. Uh, yeah. So, you know, it's not surprising to discover that many organizations had almost no plan or very few business continuity plans with these sort of lockdowns and uh, work from home orders and consideration, right? However, uh, what I've also seen is it has definitely provoked thoughts around how important it is to have a flexible work uh, dynamic, uh, including like embracing cloud technologies faster than organizations were thinking of. 
so that a job could be completed regardless of where in uh, like where are you or uh, when are you working from or, or you know it, it just it just doesn't matter I means if you have the right applications out there running uh, as a service for you you do, you just have created a flexible work and uh, work environment as well as you have given tools for folks to perform their jobs from anywhere like uh, one of the accessibility issues is with the privileged users right they they work within a very secure network um, and that is not typically reachable by regular users now with uh, with the work from home being the new norm lots of organizations have suddenly opened up their vpns virtual private networks out there for like all the employees to be able to work from home and that's kind of unusual right because if you see in contrast to like last year or even before this at 20% of employees just just 20% of the employees had vpn access in the past so definitely getting it to 100% is a load on the vpn network but also you're opening it up to non privileged users so off late uh, i've also seen that there have been a lot of compromises and hacks related to the vpn technology itself which opens up the entire network and poses a huge risk i i, I think we definitely have better solutions than that but the the approach should be to use a secure gateway kind of a solution to selectively open up apps which the users require like if you have 100 apps in your network and the user is just using one app why would you give the entire network uh, access to those users so open up those selective apps for access uh, to those users and based on um, you know kind of attribute based or role based access controls this is kind of primary thing which is going to come out of the kind of analysis which folks are going to do that okay what did we do from enablement or access enablement perspective and how much did yeah. we open up securely so yeah. definitely uh, if if we follow this kind of an approach this will improve the overall speed of uh, and you know accessibility without the need to install the cumbersome vpn clients on every workstation that's great you know i'm just wondering bob i'm hoping that you can hear us um and i think we're going to test to Please, see if sir. we can hear you <laughs> great Please, i'm wondering if you can comment on this uh, absolutely and i apologize to everyone for uh, dipping out but i but i could hear um and and sandeep i think that was an outstanding um explanation and an overview and and i really can't add a great deal to that but i do want everyone to know that uh, the industry uh, for example i was at i'm a member of the dtcc systemic risk work working group and we had a meeting or rather a conference call on monday and that um cyber risk was back up at the top and for many of the reasons that that you described i will tell you that the firm i work for and and i'll just give give a brief overview we are korea's largest non-bank financial services company we run about 400 billion dollars in assets under management we have about 7 and a half billion dollars worth of equity capital we operate in 14 different country markets we're relatively new to the united states but but we're a big firm nonetheless and i will tell you that we are into our fourth week of our bcp um uh, uh resilience plan and and i can tell you that uh we've been testing and i know lisa you and i had a chat about this briefly uh we've been testing for several years so every workstation in our shop gets tested i'm going to say at least two times a year uh for a long time we were wondering why the bcp team was leaving on fridays to go out to the dr site and now we know why uh in in our particular case uh about a month ago we broke into three groups we uh, left a third of the folks uh at the office a third worked from the bees uh, from the disaster recovery site and then another third worked from home i will say over time that plan has been adapted uh i would say that we have a skeleton crew right now uh at headquarters and most of the people are either working at the disaster recovery site or from home uh i am i'm happy to report that uh it's business as usual for us in the sense that uh, we have access to all the systems and tools that we need to 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 operate the business so so we're 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 pleased from that standpoint but i think all the points you made sandy uh are are very valid ones so thank you and it's good to be on the call
Um, as we you know, think about this a... and as we, as we think about this and cross jurisdictional issues, what are some of the, the employment and HR issues that we should be thinking about? So, so thank you, Lisa. What I, um, uh, this is Charlie Morgan. I'm, I'm glad everyone is, is joined and I hope everyone is healthy and safe. And um, I'll talk a little bit about um, working at home from an HR standpoint. And maybe if everybody could mute their phones, it would be helpful. Thank you. Um, so as we've all experienced, working from home is very different from the office. And um, I wanted to go through some of the legal and practical issues for, for working at home and talk about the Let's see if we can get everybody to mute their phones, though. Uh, so, you know, now that everybody's working at home and in the era of COVID-19, I thought I'd hit on the sort of the new and different things, at least to me, um, of challenges that I see employers are facing. And the, and the newest and most challenging and mo frankly most emotional is you know, what to do when you've got a um, sick employee, when you've got a positive COVID-19 test. And so typically now that everybody is at home, you, you, uh, you, you will hear, you know, I've got a homebound employee with COVID-19, so what am I supposed to do? I've already closed the office, the person is at home, do I owe, you know, are there other, do I owe my co-employees anything? What should I do? And so here's some thoughts on that. So I think the first rule is that you have to do what your local public health authority tells you to do. And if your local public health authority is telling you to do something, that, of course, makes it easy. They have police power and uh, they can tell you what to do and you, you need to do it. Uh, but in most cases, you don't have your local public health authority taking over and, and telling you what to do. Uh, so as a fallback, you have to look at what your public health authority has given in terms of guidance in, in this situation. Um, and some public health authorities are very explicit. Some uh, give just general advice and some give no guidance at all. And so in the absence of that guidance, you of course follow CDC guidance. And again, CDC is excellent resource, but it, it changes almost every day. It's very specific in some areas and not so specific in other areas. Typically, if you if you look at those sources, you you know often your public health authority will do a trace back and say well you know you need to communicate to your close contact people uh, who have been in close contact with that person in in 14 days prior to symptoms and uh, you need to clean where this employee was in those prior 14 days um, and so what does vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction is how far you go back. Uh, is it, you know, do I just go back 48 hours before the symptoms? Do I go back 14 days? Uh, so again, you, you want to get guidance from your local health authority. And then the second big question, which does vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, is what do I tell those close contacts? Do I do, you know, do they just need to monitor their symptoms? That's what CDC says. Do they need to quarantine? That's what some jurisdictions say. Uh, so again, you don't want to be in the business of giving medical advice. You want to direct them to their healthcare provider and their uh, local health authority. And then finally, um, one point on communicating to close contacts, uh, you, you are required under the ADA to maintain confidentiality of the of the person who is tested positive. And so you can do all this, you can communicate what these what these people need to know without 
um, communicating uh, the identity of the COVID-19 person. That's very the, helpful. I'm, I'm wondering if they're just, you know, sort of along the same vein of, of some of what you've been talking about. Um, when you think about those employees, if you've, you've dealt with now the, the sick employee, um, what about, you know, some of the anti-harassment concerns or dealing with issues of people working from home and how do you deal with timekeeping or even if you're in an unfortunate situation of needing to do a reduction in, um, in hours or, or pay? Are there things that folks should be thinking about? Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, I would say that sort of, you know, what's maybe oddly to me is that, uh, you know, your work at home, labor and employment issues are, are basically the same as your work at office issues, and you just have to make sure that your policies are capturing new, new fact situations at home so that you're, you're dealing with it. I think number one in terms of liability would be timekeeping and probably the most problematic that's always the most problematic when people are working in the office, so it's really not going to be any different from people working at home. You just can't let your guard down on compliance with timekeeping. Consistently reinforce the rules about keeping time for hourly workers. And then for salaried workers, um, uh, you know, remember you can't dock their pay based on reduced hours. Uh, otherwise, it might take them out of their exempt status. Uh, you can lower their salary if need be, but you have to ensure that they're making the minimum for their exempt status. An another issue that could come up is your expense reimbursement policy. You know, uh, this is often a state-by-state -state issue, but you should be thoughtful about you know, are my employees at home incurring expenses on my behalf? And so make sure that your expense reimbursement policy might, might capture these things. Um, and then Lisa, you mentioned anti-harassment, you know, so can workers harass each other remotely? And of course they can because they're humans and they figure out ways to do that. And so, you know, I would have for all of your policies, uh, that apply in the workplace, it's probably worth a reminder that, of course, they still apply uh, at home vis-a-vis -vis coworkers. Um, another like, puzzling issue is, okay, well, what if my person gets injured at home, or what if my person, my employee uh, it contracts COVID-19 at home? You know, is that a worker safety issue? Is that a worker's comp issue? Uh, it, there's probably a causation problem there. I don't know that that's, that would be a, an employer responsibility, um, but it's a way for a, a company to reduce its risk is, of course, to communicate and remind people that they need to follow their CDC guidelines and safe practices uh, wherever they are, including at home. Lisa, can I can I add something to that, please? Yes, I was just going to ask you to. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Just a different perspective on on what Char Charlie uh, mentioned a moment ago. Um, what we've tried to do, and it's an extension of our uh, BCP uh, dispersion strategy, ha has been to try to, to the extent possible, replicate the positive, constructive, professional work environment that we had while we were in the office on a remote basis. And, and while I don't think that's entirely possible to do, uh, what we have done, and in large measure, thanks to, to the, the ability to stay in touch with each other through electronic communication, as I, as I mentioned a moment ago, is we have regular uh, phone conversations with people, emails, we chat, we do it one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we do it departmentally. Uh, once a week, we have a town hall. Now, quite frankly, when we were all together, we didn't have town halls once a week. But now we have town halls once a week where we have an opportunity to update people uh, on, on what's going on firm-wide and what's happening industry-wide. It's also an opportunity for us to field questions. So 
times like these require all of us to be uh, adaptive and innovative, uh, but I think a lot of it hinges around your ability to maintain workflow. And in our case, workflow uh, is largely determined by our ability to communicate electronically. So as long as you have that, I, I think that you're in a good position uh, if you can be creative, and, and I have to say that in our case, uh, we did think about this, although I'm not sure that we uh, thought it would be a pandemic that would cause us to do this, but nevertheless, uh, this was part of our BCP uh, planning. Uh, and I think maybe Sandeep, you might have thoughts on this. I know over the last 20 years, I, I mean, I was around for 9-11, and I remember that security became a big issue, and then a couple of years later, it was SARS. And then we started to plan around uh, accessing third-party uh, trusted uh, uh, service providers. And, and more recently, uh, we've been talking about resilience planning in the industry. So, so I think this has been out there a long time uh, or several years, but, but I'm not quite sure we ever envisioned it would be caused by a pandemic. Um, so, I, so I think it's really critical that to the extent possible, you try to maintain that corporate culture even though you may not be face-to-face. -face. That, that, that seems to be really important. Uh, I, I think what we're also trying to do is make people feel like they are still valued team members, and I, I think that's really important. I think many of us are not used to working uh, in an isolated fashion as we are being called upon to do now. So all the more reason uh, to try to communicate, stay in touch, Again, in, in our case, we, we try one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, it's, it's on a daily basis. We, we talk departmentally, and then we talk from a firm-wide basis uh, through a town hall. I think that's a, a great idea. And, and Cindy, if I'm going to give you an uh, opportunity to, to join in, I, I'll, I'll throw in, you know, some of the things that we've been doing at our firm, which has included, just as, as you've said, Bob, which is to really have more, um, and we do our Zoom meetings. We felt that being able to see people face-to-face -face was really important um, and doing them much more frequently than, than we ever did. I will say we've also focused on trying to put together some social events. Our HR department has put together um, um, drop-in cocktail hours, as well as um, we have a pub trivia evening planned, which I'm sure Charlie is just going to raise all sorts of HR issues. But, um, Sandeep, I, I know we, when we were talking about and preparing for this, um, for this conversation, we were talking about how important it was to do this for your employees, but also some of the ideas you've had to help your clients stay in touch with their clients. Absolutely. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Awesome. Uh, yeah, no, definitely. Um, I work with a lot of uh, my clients like, across the globe. And, you know, regardless of where you are, it was always important to just meet them face to face. So I used to travel quite a bit. I mean, my travel has drastically uh, stopped. And um, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of good or nice to have uh, at times. But, you know, in these times when you cannot meet people, these web conferencing and all online collaboration tools is, is not a nice to have, but a must to have. You like you need to have a few things from a consideration uh, standpoint. Like by choosing these platforms, you of course need to have uh, ensured that you know these are these can meet your scale requirements, security requirements, but also like show up or you know with a video so that you can interact with a person on the other side. It's it's as important as you know talking to them. You also need to see what they're uh, kind of, you know, feeling about the uh, conversation you're having or, you know, have a little bit of a personal dialogue with them rather than just having a kind of a communication and, you know, a following up. Uh, one thing I've noticed from a, uh, you know, collaboration perspective that it's almost like kind of death of emails. I'm not sure everyone else has noticed or not, but since everyone is expecting that people are sitting behind their computers every time, you just slack them or you just chat with them, uh, which kind of creates a very closed loop communication rather than uh, sending out an email, expecting it to be replied back after uh, probably a few hours or within 24 hours or days. It just, the communication has become more rapid in the workforce side. Um, the other thing I'm also noticing, which I think should have happened much before, is um, to have these solutions all being protected by multi-factor authentication means I cannot stress more the importance of it. More and more, you know, systems and uh, services being adopted for remote workforce 
you need to ensure that you're just not relying on the passwords. I mean, that's, that, that's kind of a collateral thing which is going to come out of all of this enablement, which we're seeing uh, in, in a kind of a rapid fashion that, okay, how do I secure it? And if I secure it, can I actually just not have passwords protecting it? Can I have something more? And doesn't just ensure that the clients you are connecting to, they also feel secure because they are joining your meetings to collaborate with you and they should feel secure as well. I think it's just a platform on which you interact with them nowadays just needs to empower people rather than, you know, be uh, doubting that can I share this over here or not or should I send you an email or not. I, I think folks are uh, more empowered and more open when you have tools and technologies which kind of, you know, make them secure, feel secure at least, right? And, and the adoption for these technologies from a vendor standpoint, like like what we have, we have seen a tremendous increase as well. Like monitoring tools, people are now more and more investing in it because they want to know what, what their employees are doing. I mean, at the end of the day, you have opened it up for so many folks suddenly, like various different technologies. You kind of need to see what's going on, if there are suspicious activities somewhere, can we flag it or not? So it has become a challenge. So like over over the few months, the next few months, you're going to see that the technology companies are going to do really well, uh, you know, who are focused on these kind of remote workforce tools and technologies and services. But at the end of the day, which technology makes it more personal? What kind of uh, ground rules you follow to interact with your clients? Uh, those uh, firms and those uh, industries are going to flourish a little bit more because then they'll be uh, able to continue with the kind of momentum they had when they uh, were face to face. I think that's a, that's a great thing to point out. And, and you know, what you've said about um, people sort of the death of email, which may or may not be the case, um, but I, I think that there's definitely an emphasis on being able to communicate faster. And certainly the more apps, you know, corporate apps that you have that you're able to control and have security over um, sort of keeps people from defaulting to text messaging on their cell phones and which then just creates all sorts of an issue for um, legal and compliance officers who are trying to monitor what, what's going on. Um, I'm conscious of the time that we have and we wanted to sort of give a little bit of time to talk about, um, and, and again, not and nobody needs to tell tales, but maybe to talk a little bit about some of the things that you've tried and didn't work and you've, and you've moved on to other things or things that you've thought about in, in sort of coping with the challenges of having a large amount of your workforce um, working from home. And I know, Bob, you've covered a lot of this, but I just wanted to give you the opportunity to add anything else and that you've seen um, or that your firm has thought about. Um, I'll share the, you know, the, the, what we thought about, which is um, whether fortunately or unfortunately, um, Asia seemed to get hit first and um, being part of uh, global industry groups, uh, someone had given us a tip that um, you really need to look at the broadband coverage that your employees have. And when you've got, you know, two people working full time at home, you've got, you know, kids who are remote learning, gaming, and watching Netflix, are you going to have enough um, internet bandwidth in order to actually have your employees working effectively? So that was one of the things that our technology people focused on to try and make sure that um, we all would have what we needed to be able to do what we need to do to get through the day. So Bob, with that, maybe you could comment? Yes, and as you indicated, you and I had chatted about that. And on our end, we had looked at that in advance and, and the types of applications that our employees run uh, have not thus far uh, posed any type of uh, capacity issues on, on, on their own. Now, now we do have dedicated lines in some cases, so that, that obviously would ease the burden. But, but I have to say up to this point, uh, we're, we're pleased with uh, how the planning has gone. Uh, but, we, but we're a larger firm, we did think this through. Uh, I suppose smaller firms, probably don't in many cases have the uh, scale resources required to specialize like this. We, we have a staff that, that looks at issues like this. So resilience operating uh, is, is, a big, uh, is a big issue for us. And again, when you consider the type of work we're in, uh, we always have to make sure that uh, if the market's up and running, that we are there to operate smoothly and securely on behalf of customers and counterparties. So, uh, knock on wood, thus far, uh, we, we've, we've come through that unscathed. 
And, and Bob, one of the things that you'd mentioned to me, which I thought would be great for you to address is sort of where, if, if you are a smaller firm and you're actually struggling right now, um, some of the places to go for help, sure. you were talking about the fact that um, you yeah. have some ideas. <laughs> yeah, well, well, a couple of things. No, number one, I, I think many folks know that, that to use prime brokers, prime brokers can be a great resource uh, from an enterprise-wide standpoint, whether it's uh, launching a business, operating a business, finding miss the, the missing pieces uh, to, to successfully operate your business, your prime broker should be in a good position to help you with that. that that's number one. Number two, and perhaps more immediate, um, I, I was able to be on a call yesterday with uh, uh, Congressman Rodney Davis of Illinois, along with uh, uh, Nicole Malyatakis, who was running for Congress here uh, in uh, Staten Island in Brooklyn. And one of the things they talked about were the government initiatives. And while this may not be news to many people, it, it was a bit news-oriented for me, and that is that the CARES Act, the CARES Act uh, gives small businesses, which is to say businesses with fewer than 500 employees, the ability to access up to a $10 million line of credit. And that the principle on that line, I understand, is forgivable if the proceeds are used for payroll, rent, utilities, uh, things like that. And if anyone is interested in learning more about that or talking uh, to, to uh, Assemblywoman Malyatakis, I'm, I'm more than happy to put you in touch with her. Uh, I do have her direct line and, and she'll take any calls. But I thought that was, uh, that was particularly, that could be especially useful to people that uh, are feeling stressed right now from a business standpoint. That's great, thank you. And you know, one of the other things that we've spoken about as a group was sort of looking at the point in time where you would be sort of getting back to work. It's now looking like that may take a little bit longer. And given that the work from home orders may be longer than we anticipated, um, I was going to ask each of you to potentially think about um, other things that you might be thinking about in, and, and may be able to jog people thoughts in terms of what they want to consider as they're looking at maybe a, a longer runway for working from home. I know one of the things that we've been speaking about is um, just thinking about the office that we've left and whether or not we have the right measures of security um, in place for just equipment that's been left in the office, whether or not in, in our, um, you know, in, in one of our office spaces we have cameras and whether or not we're getting the feeds from the cameras on a regular basis, to even just canceling things like did anyone remember to cancel the fruit order um, so that it's not, you know, it's not sitting there, to how are you, what are you doing to deal with the mail? So I'm just wondering, and maybe Charlie, let's let's start with you. And and you can it, it doesn't even have to be at a firm level, but just maybe from your practice level or things that you're hearing from your clients. What are some of the things that um, you know you're hearing or are talking to your clients about thinking about in the longer term? So uh, yeah, it seems like mail is the uh, is the hardest thing to deal with because it does take humans to get it and see if it's important. And so I'm sure everybody here has a plan for that. The challenge is, uh, you know, that, you know, what if those those people get sick? And so uh, we've had a couple of bumps in the road there. Uh, but, you know, luckily, um, not too much, at least in, in our world now, you know, there's not that much critical stuff that does come through the mail, but you you know we're we're still having to have um, a crew uh, that that scans everything and and distributes it on out. What I was uh, thinking about is that you know I think optimistically I think we should all be thinking about returning to the office and ramping up and what does that look like and um, to go ahead and start planning for that because presumably what it looks like is uh, a small group of people starting out uh, and it's, you know, you're taking precautions, you probably are still social distancing and you're slowly ramping back up so that you don't have another problem, of course, subject to any and all state and local rules, but I would start now, if you haven't already, to start thinking about the, the practical aspects of, of everybody coming back. 
Sure. Absolutely. I think uh, that's a great point, right, Charlie? And one thing I wanted to add was, you know, there's nothing good about this uh, pandemic, right? But maybe there can be some collateral benefits. Like, for example, people who should have been using and embracing these remote working technologies, uh, now they're forced to use it. And they should have done that already, but at least now it's beginning to uh, come into effect. I would say focus on what you can control, right? It's important to understand that there will be a lasting change in the way people work after this emergency passes. It means there's no doubt about it. Enterprises will, like, embrace remote workers and to be able to conduct businesses from anywhere. And, and this will dramatically overall increase uh, efficiency and time management. You, you would see that, you know, a lot of people, like I'm in Bay Area, San Francisco, and how many people were stuck in traffic like every day and, and wasting almost like hours and hours to commute uh, up and down. And uh, I think that's going to dramatically, you know, see a shift in how people, you know, would embrace remote working. And also, at the end of the day, the kind of things which you can avoid, uh, you know, uh, by in terms of meeting folks and businesses with, from a travel perspective, uh, not just that, but also – certain services which you do not need to run in your own office. If you can, if you can have that being running in a, in a service like a cloud service or a SaaS application, people would embrace that more and more. I mean, think about we are talking about disaster recovery solutions and uh, resiliency plans and everything, right? Uh, what better time to actually think about going and, uh, you know, having a service which you can subscribe to, which is always up and running for you rather than, your IT staff maintaining it. So I think those shifts are definitely going to happen, and it's going to happen for good. So. That's great. Uh, Sandy. Thank you, Sandy. Go ahead, Bob. Okay, Lisa. So, so I, I think that Sandy makes some excellent points uh, about how the nature of work is, is going to change forever. I, I think you're 100% right. I think that the technologies are there. Uh, in many cases, they're, they're sufficiently evolved that we can disperse, we can decentralize. I will tell you that notwithstanding the crisis uh, in our business, uh, we continue to bring new business on. Uh, I'm actually quite surprised. I'm also quite surprised to the, the extent to which uh, prospective clients and clients want to engage us on Zoom or Microsoft Teams. So we've done a lot of, uh, a lot of work there. Uh, so I see that going forward is, is becoming uh, much more front and center and how we operate our businesses. I do want to share this one story. Uh, as I mentioned, Mire is, uh runs about $400 billion. We also allocate assets to alternative managers. And in February, I was taking nine U.S. managers over to Seoul to meet five investor slash allocators. It was a big and important trip, at least from my standpoint, and probably, probably from the standpoint of the managers. And I would say you know, we, we were monitoring the situation constantly, and up until I would say maybe 10 days before we were supposed to be there in the middle of February, it was all lights were green, all systems were go. Then all of a sudden, it was a 180. And my Korean colleagues began telling me about the policies the firm and, and the city and the country were beginning to enact. And I thought to myself, this sounds so odd. Imagine that, you, you can't get together uh, with more than five or ten people, um, and, and that the streets at night are empty. I said, this can't be, this can't be true. And, and what I came to realize, I think, was that we're probably, and this is anecdotal, this is, this is my assessment, we're probably six to eight weeks behind them um, in, in terms of how things move. Now, of course, facts and circumstances are, are different everywhere. Uh, and that's, that certainly applies here. But my, my sense is if, when you were asking the question about when we're going to go back to work, um, I, as a general rule of thumb, I, I've used, like I said, six to eight weeks, um, uh, give or minus, uh, off of Seoul, Korea, which in, in my view I puts us right. about a couple of weeks in. I hope you're right, Bob. I guess, you know, Charlie, here's a question, question for you um, that's come in. If you're thinking about updating your employee manual, should you be doing it now or should you wait until the evolution of this current pandemic is over and, and then do it? So I don't think, I don't think there's a wrong answer to that. I think that, um, I, you know, I think that People are seeing that their policies probably need to be adjusted, 
And what I'm seeing more uh, frequently is just, uh, you know, he, here's a specific policy for this and roll that out as opposed to a wholesale revisiting your your handbook. I do uh, agree that, you know, once that we're back to normal, and we will be, uh, that I think people will really be looking hard at, you know, what policies make sense uh, and what don't, and, and that probably is the time for a wholesale review and revision of, of how you how you deal with things. Great. And, and again, if you don't want to answer this one, that's fine, but um, a question came in about um, requiring um, folks to go to a DR site or be considered an essential worker to the extent that they have a high risk um, family member at home. Is that an issue people should discuss with their own personal attorneys? Is there some general way to think about that that you can share? I can give some general thoughts on that, which is frankly to punt. Uh, that issue has come up hypothetically many, many times, and we've talked about it. Uh, because there are, uh, you know, essential workers and you, you know, there's, we all have uh, situations, most employers have situations where people simply have to go in uh, and work and what to do if somebody doesn't want to do that. Um, and so it, it, I just would apply the rule of reason actually uh, and, and decide, you know, is there, you know, what are, how am I going to be judged on this decision? You know, and, and uh, am I being reasonable or unreasonable? And so factors, of course, high risk, high risk of a family member. Um, can I, can I commute safely to the location once I'm at the location? Uh, are you taking all proper precautions? And so if you can get comfortable, um, that there's not a good reason, um, that the person doesn't want to come in, uh, you know, a solution may be, well, we're, you know, we're certainly not going to force you to come in, but we're not going to pay you if you don't come in. Uh, and, and so that, that's at least something to consider, uh, when you're, when you're going through the options. The flip side of that is something that we talked about before, which I think is also a problem, are people who in, insist on coming in and keep coming in, even though your office is closed. And that's a problem. And I think you can be, as strict or lax, I guess, as, as you want, but it's a problem because it, uh, you know, you're, you're, they're potentially putting others at risk and it's, it, it's sort of, it's complicating, um, the reasons of why you have closed that office and, and they might be violating local law too. Right. Lisa, no, thank can, you can very I much. comment on that? Sure. Sure. I, I, so I just want to say that, um, beginning about six weeks ago, during face-to-face -face town hall meetings, we began telling employees that if you are sick or if there are people home that are sick, to please let us know. And we strongly encourage people to stay home who were sick. We also began telling employees when we were still going into the city uh, that if you were going to public places, to please let us know, in, in which case we would ask you to self-quarantine for two weeks. We also said to people, uh, that if you were going to continue to come into the city to please not use mass transportation and that the company would pay for your uh, transport uh, to and from home. Uh, our DR site, uh, we have people, uh, as I said, staff there, and they are all apart from each other as, as dictated by local jurisdictions and, and uh, as suggested by uh, medical professionals. So, so we've certainly tried to take this very seriously. Um, I must say that, that, that no one has, uh, we, we've more or less either assigned you home or to go to a DR site and no one has insisted on going into the office so far. So that has not been a problem for us. Not, not, not surprising. <laughs> not, not a problem. Um, Candy, we did it. Yeah, we did have one question for you, and which you may or may not be able to answer, but um, there's been a lot of chatter about some of the common collaboration sites like Zoom and LoopUp and, and Teams, um, and there have been some suggestions that um, they get overwhelmed at the top of the hour and the bottom of the hour and just stagger your meetings. Is that, is that just um, uh, urban legend, or is, is that something we all should be thinking about? I think, yeah, in general, the scalability concern is out there, right? No one was prepping up to have that kind of a scalability uh, requirement. 
I, but I did hear from companies who are a little bit forward thinking in terms of uh, provisioning extra hardware and services, right? So Zoom, I was hearing their uh, CFO on Bloomberg, and they were talking about that uh, they actually had a foresight to double their capacity uh, in January or February timeframe, which is which is amazing. Thinking the you know uh, shelter at home and stay at home orders were not even in place by that time, but they did provision that. But yeah, this is absolutely happening when people log in at the same time. The concurrency limit hits, uh, and you know people start seeing uh, lag over there from every service responding at the same time. So that's, that's happening just because I think the service providers were not prepped up uh, altogether for this kind of a pandemic and the resource requirements from uh, from remote sites. But I think slowly uh, what folks are going to do is also have a contingency plan for these services. Like if you have one service working for uh, one particular purpose, if it's not available, you have other service through which you can still interact with your uh, employees or with your uh, workforce in general. I think those kind of business continuity plans are also going to come up, but I think it's too early to say what kind of things uh, would be available from a service scaling perspective. But uh, definitely, I hear that too, that you know, at the top of the hour, you, you see a lot of people actually uh, almost like scrambling for, okay, how do I get in? And uh, yeah, that, that's going to happen for at least a month or two. Sure. Well, thank you for that. And um, we are just coming up upon the top of the hour. I'm going to give every speaker um, the opportunity to sort of have one one last say. Um, we were going to call this our lightning round with uh, sort of your, your one piece of advice or your one last thought. And I guess I'll, I'll throw in mine. Mine is um, our firm uh, is one that has gone through a number of um, a, a number of mergers and, and acquisitions over the past few years, and therefore we were fortunate to have many redundancies of systems and never been more thankful that we had multiple avenues for communicating with one another. Um, Sandeep, maybe you could give us your final thought? Yeah, I think this pandemic has made us realize that essentials should be the priority, right? And by essentials, I don't mean toilet paper, but invest responsibly and for the future. And what I mean by that is investment of resources, technology, and also security for business continuity. Uh, this will help optimize how you run the business, but also planning for the pandemics like these in the future. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but yeah, preparation is necessary. Fantastic. Um, Charlie, what about you? One last thought? So I would say remember that when you're asking your coworker or somebody to do something that you just really never know what's going on at the other end and that, uh, you know, the like kid tutoring, another person in the house working, uh, lots of challenges that you don't really know and lots of stress that uh, I don't think I really expected to be at home. And so we, we have to make sure we're giving everybody a break and give ourselves a break. Thank you. And Bob, take us home. Last good piece of advice. Okay, Lisa. So, so I, I, I would add to what's already been said that for those of you that work with small companies, particularly smaller money management firms, uh, the issues and the challenges that we've discussed this afternoon uh, are, are, are very daunting. Um, they, they cross a lot of different lines. You may or may not have the subject matter expertise to help you identify the issues and guide you through them. I would say that among other groups, uh, your prime brokers should be able to help you with this. Um, and, and more than happy to answer any questions in terms of identifying resources uh, like I said, I think a prime broker is in a good position to assist you with this, at least identifying issues and finding the right resources to solve the problems. Thank you, Lisa. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of our speakers and especially to our um, our sponsors. It's much, much appreciated. And for all of you for joining, I'm sorry for the technical issues. If any of you were not able to catch the entirety of the conversation, there will be a replay available on the New York Air website. And we encourage you to listen and pass it on. Um, if you want um, membership information, you can find it on the website as well. And if you have any questions for our speakers, our contact information is important. Posted. And with that, I thank you all and stay safe.